Welcome to the Product Boss Podcast, where we help product-based businesses grow their sales and improve their strategies. Hey, everyone. I want to introduce you to my co-host and biz bestie, Mina Kunlosita, an Amazon guru that has built a multi-six-figure product-based business. In introducing the other half of the product boss, Jacqueline Snyder, she has helped launch and grow over 500 fashion apparel and accessory brands, even one of her own. And together, we share our inventory of secret weapons that will help you dig deep and do the work it takes. Are you ready? Let's build together. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Product Boss Podcast. I'm your host, Jacqueline Snyder, with my brilliant co-host, Mina kunlo Sitap. Hey, Mina. Hey, Jacqueline. So today we are so excited. We are joined by a guest. We have Carol Cox of Speaking Your Brand. Welcome to the podcast, Carol. Thank you so much, Jacqueline and Mina, for having me. I am excited about this. I remember when you all launched the podcast and I was was really excited when you did that. So I'm honored to be a guest now. We are so excited that you're here. Um, We have met Carol in person at events. So she is a friend and um, really a mentor and someone that we listen to because you have a podcast that we love and translate. And we are so excited to have you on because we'd love for you to speak to our product bosses about really how to... Uh, pitch their brand, how to speak their brand, and um, really kind of focus in on the product side of it. So thanks. Yeah, this is going to be fun because products, as you all know, and and the listeners know who have product-based businesses are definitely kind of a beast on their own. And so it's going to be, it will be fun for us to dig in a bit about how as a product-based entrepreneur, you can pitch your product, whether it's to distributors, to investors, and even to your customer base at large. Love it. So tell our listeners a little bit about you. Sure. So I started speaking your brand back in 2015 because I had been a computer programmer. So I had built software products and then I just got burnt out. I wanted to work with people, not with code anymore. So I decided, so I kind of looked around, I talked to some friends and I was thinking about what kind of business could I start? And they said, well, Carol, you always do such a great job with your presentations. You help us when we need to go do speaking and presentations. Why don't you build a business around that? And it sounds kind of crazy at first. You're like, you can build a business around doing this, but here I am three, almost four years later. And I've done exactly that. I love working with women entrepreneurs to create their signature talk. Usually they're going out and giving business presentations or keynotes or even TEDx talks. So that's, that's what I help them to create that content and to give them the confidence to go out and share their message. You blew us away. You were actually one of the speakers at the first Biz Chicks Live, which was not this past year, but the year before. And I remember just connecting with everything you were saying. First of all, of course, you know, you knew what you were doing and it was just like seeing you up there and you just get so inspired. And then you broke it down into alliteration, which we all love. (laughs) <laughs> it makes it so memorable, doesn't it? It really does. It really does. We were saying to Carol free call, we were like the three C's and she's like, which C's? I use so many C's. <laughs> I probably have like 10 different versions of the three C's because there's a lot of good words that start with C. Yeah. And it's your initials, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Branding. That is perfect. So since we're talking about the three C's, let's dig into those and, and see where we go with that. Okay, so the three C's that we're going to focus on today are consistency of your message, context, so making your message relevant and relatable to whoever you're speaking to, and then community. So how can you build your community, build your network, build your customer base so they start talking about you as much as you're talking about yourself and your own product? So we're going to focus on those three C's today. And you want me to go ahead and get started with the first C, consistency? Yeah, it's an important one for sure. And I'll I'll start off by saying this. It is really hard to figure out what your brand message is for yourself. So right now, I'm as we're recording this, I'm in the middle of a of a website redo. So I'm completely redoing the design, the layout, and the verbiage of my website. And I had to put together the verbiage for the homepage. So I'm putting it all and I'm just looking at it like, God, this is this is not it. It's just, it's not, it's not resonating. So then my husband who also does work with me, he looked at it and of course, like he just went through it and he did it all. Like he made it incredible because I'm too close to it in my own business. So let me just say that for all of you listening, that it's hard to do it with on your own. That's why like being part of a mastermind that Jacqueline and Mina has or, or hiring a coach or hiring someone to help you 
is going to, or even just grabbing a friend or a colleague and talking these things through makes it so much easier because when you finally figure out what that consistent message is, then you become excited to share it versus, you know, when you get up in front of a room and you have 30 seconds or a minute to introduce yourself and you're like, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know what words to use. How are people going to understand what I'm saying? But once you figure out what that message is, then you become excited to share it because you know it will help people. I think that's really the key is knowing that your message is almost like a public service announcement. You're doing the audience a service by letting them know that your product exists because you know how helpful it can be to them. So I was just thinking about, I had a strategy session call with a client last week and she has a give back type, like a mission-based business. And I ended up on her site and I was like, what, what are we giving back to? You know, what, what's the point? Like, why am I buying these? What's the point? And it, and on websites, for example, you get three seconds to hold people's attention. So if it's not above the fold, they're going to, they're going to leave. And so I think exactly what you're saying when you're so close to it, your brain almost shortcuts information, right? So we jump from something like, well, obviously it's, I'm doing this for this, but then if somebody's brand new to that, you show up and you're working with me in a one-on-one session and I look at your site and I have these questions, let's figure out why I have those questions and, and then how to fill that in. Yes, exactly. So then let's think about then for this consistent message, how you as a product-based entrepreneur can start to frame it. So I would go back to your origin story. Why did you create, invent, put together your product in the first place? Usually you were scratching your own itch. So you were faced with a situation with a problem and you were trying to figure out how to solve it. You maybe looked around in the marketplace, you tried to find a product that would solve the problem that you were having and maybe you couldn't find one or the ones that you found were lacking something or were missing something. So you decided to be an entrepreneur and create something on your own. So what was that reason? What was that problem you were having? Because most likely the customers who are going to be really your most loyal customers and engaged customers are going to be the ones who have who are experiencing that same situation and they just haven't found your product yet. So what was that what was that itch that you were scratching? And I'm sure you probably see this Mina and Jacqueline with the with your your listeners and with the clients that you have. Yeah, we we do. They basically create off of their own struggle and that makes it a lot easier. But it's pretty much why Little Labels is invented, right? It is. It is. um, Out of frustration and um, more so just like I thought, it's been five years. I waited five years between my kids. This still hasn't been solved. (laughs) So you gave someone else the opportunity and they still didn't take it. (laughs) Come on, five years, technology has changed. And here's a fun thing that you can do. So there's this six step process uh, that Pixar, you know, the Pixar, the movie studio that makes these incredible movies that they go through when they have to pitch their movies within Pixar. So I can kind of run through this because it's a great structure to use initially when you're trying to think about how to create this consistent message. So first of all, is what you're talking about, what is that? What is your audience, your customer base? What is their pain or their problem? So they do it in like a once upon a time story structure. So they say once upon a time, there was a mom who was struggling with breastfeeding her children. So that was the problem that she was facing. And then the next sentence is basically, why hasn't the problem been solved? And so then you say every day she would attempt to nurse her child, but there, you know, she was frustrated. The child was frustrated. She was, so she was trying to figure out what to do. And then the third sentence is, so what's possible? And then one day, so this is the structure, then one day she realized she was doing some research and she found an an ingredient, an herbal ingredient, whatever it happens to be, that could be the answer. Then the fourth sentence is, because of that, so because of that, she decided to make her own tea or cookies to help with the lactation process. And then the next sentence is another because of that. And because of that, she was happy her child was happy, child was getting the, the milk and nutrition that he needed. And then the sixth sentence is until finally, which is then the kind of the closing of it, until finally she realized that other moms could benefit from having this herbal tea as well. So she decided to, to batch produce it and start making it for her friends. And now this has led to a worldwide company. So that's a fun way to get started because then you're really drawing out the problem, the problem, the pain point. You're drawing out what the situation looked like that before state. Then what was the the solution to that? 
And then what was the after state? And I think this is where a lot of entrepreneurs, the step that they miss is they do the before and the, and the solution. So here was the problem. Here's your solution, my product. But then they don't do the after, which is what's the transformation that happens after you start using the product. Your child is happy. You're happy. You save time. You're less stressed. Whatever the product is related to, that's the, that's the piece that's really important because that's what's going to pull that customer in or the investor or the distributor is that transformation piece. I was like, I, when you said that, I was like, mic drop, you can just go now. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take that long. No, no but I, but it, it is so important, like that transformation. And for, and it, we work on that ideal customer avatar. We have, you know, a whole kit for it. Um, people work through it, but sometimes they think that they know their customer, but they're not really living in their customer's shoes. So why you're solving a problem, like if they had this wish, how you would solve or how you would grant their wish, right? So I think there's a lot of ways into it, but the story I think is really clear for people to step by step through it because sometimes the concept's too big. So when you, I don't know if you guys mentioned, but the, the lactation cookies, like we talk about milk bliss a lot and they're a client of ours and they're in our masterminds. And so they have these amazing cookies that they, they, they did and they have a Kickstarter and they were talking about um, this tongue tie that their kids had. And of all the time we ever worked with them, we didn't know that. So we didn't know that their children had trouble breastfeeding to then equal, you know, needing to like produce more milk, needing lactation cookies. So it's just a really great story. So I love that. And it's those details that we think are extraneous or we think that are are not important, but it's those little details that are going to, they're going to make me remember those cookies versus something else that I see out there because those, and it's the visual of the language that you're using is going to help cement and make it memorable in the person's mind who's hearing it. It's the combination of the words and then the visual imagery. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So then let's talk about the second C, which is context. So that's making your message relevant and relatable to your audience. And we kind of just mentioned that about the visual words. So metaphors, similes, things, stories that you can share that the audience is going to remember and that they can picture themselves in doing, using that product and the benefits that they're getting. So Jacqueline, you just mentioned about a lot of times, even though these product-based entrepreneurs are creating this product because of their own need, maybe it's been several years since they had that need because maybe their product life cycle development was a little bit longer. So they've forgotten what it's like. So that's why customer research, market research, empathy, putting yourself in your customer's shoes is so important. And we get stuck behind our computers a lot and, or you know, making our products and we're on the go, 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 that we forget how important it is to have that continual feedback with our customers. I have a client that does plus size clothing for women. And she had said to me that part of the reason she created this plus size line was she wanted to feel comfortable in her body right now. So not for what she dreams to lose weight, not for the past person, but in her body today as it stands and to find that comfort. And that that's, again, that need that she found that wasn't met and she created it herself. So, but the thing is, is it's not in all of her messaging. So so you can sell plus size clothes. You can sell plus size clothes for girls that always want to be curvy because there's a whole movement that way where like you're perfect in your current body. And then there's there's a sort of like for when I lose weight, but this idea of like the today, the right now, I thought was such a strong message and that it should be almost talked about always. Yes. Well, that's the consistency part right, right. there. And then the story that like she said about, you can even go back to that Pixar structure where, you know, every day or once upon a time, you know, I would buy clothes that were too small, you know, waiting for the day when I would be that size. And then every day I would be frustrated because I wouldn't have enough clothes in my closet to wear that fit me today. And then you keep hammering this message of what is working for me today. I love that. Great example. Yeah. My daughter's in third grade and she's learning how to write stories you know, the hero story, the, the writer's arc and all that stuff. So one of the things that she picked up was something that I use for my business when I'm trying to visualize my, my ideal client. And it's learning how to use transitions, like the word meanwhile. So if you're picturing your ideal client, and for me, it's a mom, she's busy, she's labeling her bottles. Meanwhile, her kids are dumping out all the totes. Meanwhile, her husband's at work. Meanwhile, her dog is barking at the deer in her backyard, right? So you get this whole picture, meanwhile, 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 and it's easier to produce in your mind rather than trying to think of that person's whole life. Um, Think of them as like a character in a story. Meanwhile, what's happening in her life? 
Like that one scene, like what is yeah. going on in that one scene in her kitchen that day at her, in her house. I love yeah. that. She wrote a story that was like, they were supposed to practice it. And it was so funny. She had to read to us at a conference and it was cracking me up. It was like, my dad was fishing. Meanwhile, my grandma was making pho. Meanwhile, my mom was watching Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Do you watch Wheel of Fortune? <laughs> yeah. Well, she, my mother, we are at my mother's. Oh. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea all those were happening right then. Can I just say how much I, it warms my heart that your daughter in third grade is learning about the hero's journey? Like, right. That is, that oh is my so gosh. To me. I so know. Believe me. I was like, oh my gosh, tell me more. Like, how's it going? That's fantastic. Okay. So that was the second C is context. So again, those stories, even, so you have your own origin story as the entrepreneur, but then you have your customer stories. What transformations have your customers on, undergone because they've used your product? And you want that, the emotional, the tangible side is good. Okay, so these are the tangible things that happen as, as a result of the product, but what is the emotional side of it? And that's what really makes a great story is making sure to bring the visuals in and the emotional aspect. So if we jumped it. back into, sort of, for example, Milk Bliss, shout out to you ladies if you're listening, <laughs> um, but because we're, we're working with them, so we're, they're really top of mind for us. But for example, that emotional, that journey, if they, were, if they thought about their, consistent, their message consistently and the context, and so let's say they shared it personally, then can they share consistently messages of moms that struggled with lactation issues and then how their how it was resolved, right? So that context mm-hmm. and taking that same core context, but repeating it in a bunch of different ways. So customer's journey, like you said, and the con like the origin story of the business. Yes, exactly. And then for those customers, what was that emotional transformation that they had? So you can say, yes, and then I was able to nurse easily every time that I needed to. Okay. So that's again, the tangible kind of functional aspect of it. But then how did that mom feel inside? What did that do to her and how in her relationship with her child and how she felt about herself? That's what you want to pull out and share on whether you're sharing on social media or you're sharing on your website. Those are the stories that you want to put on there. Cause there's always that panic when you're nursing and you don't think you can nurse. And then you're calling the doctor with a newborn. Cause you're not sure if they're getting enough nutrition. I mean, there's absolute panic that runs through people, um, and fear and scared of like, of not being able to feed your baby, obviously when they get older. But I think that very, very, very beginning, especially new moms will panic because they are expected to do something and they don't know what the results will be. So I think that's awesome. And so, so that was the second C context making it relevant and relatable with your stories. And then the third C is the community. So that's really where you're going back to your customers and you're helping them see themselves as part of a larger movement. And that's really what's going to help the product to take off. So with the Milk Bliss cookies, to get their customers not only excited about using it for themselves, but getting them excited to share it with other moms and their mom groups, whether it's mom groups that they're a part of locally in their town or city or mom groups that they're a part of online, like Facebook groups, is getting them excited to share it, not because they're getting paid to share it or because it's an affiliate link. I mean, that's, you know, that's a whole nother discussion, but because they truly want to be a part of this movement and help other moms or help other people, whatever product it happens to be, to help them benefit from it. So um, should we try and do this again for another type of of client? Should we yeah. like tr- yeah. try and throw three C's at another? It's another product you know, that you think that we're working with right now that... Um, oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I have one. I don't know okay. if she's a client of yours or not, but so I met her at Biz Chicks Live and that was Skylar Yu. Yeah, she is she's a client. Skylar. Alice Yu. Okay. So her company is Skylar Yu and her name is Alice. Mm-hmm. And so you can't, listeners can't see, but behind me on my bookshelf, I have a, what is it called? Like a little a plaque. Print. I have mine of hers behind me. Okay. So it it says shatter the glass ceiling and Alice makes these incredible t-shirts and artwork, wall prints and things about for feminists. And it's about women power, girl power, all of that. So I love these products. I love the message because it resonates with my values and I want to display my values. So when I ordered this and I got it, what did I do? I took a picture. I shared it on Facebook. I shared it on Instagram because not only was it just a t-shirt or a piece of artwork, which there's literally millions and millions of those out there, but it had a message behind it. And Alice's company, Scholar U, is not shy or afraid of really pushing that feminist message on their social media and on their website because they know that that's who their customer base is and they need to attract that customer base with their products. Yep. I actually helped her launch it with your designer consulting co-op. And then she was one of our first masterminders. She is incredible because she has such a strong message. And like you said, she fully 
commits to stand behind it. She wears it. She is just so the depth of, of her. When you speak to her, you feel so connected. And I think she brought that out in her clothes. So she has been very consistent. She doesn't go and do another type of message. It does stay very femi- feminine, like feminist movement. And it was a very good time for her to launch her line through these movements. And then um, how would you say what her context then? What would you say? So she's got her message, her consistent. Yeah, her, yeah, her message is definitely consistent. Now context, this is where I would love to see her Skylar you, her company do more stories. So to talk about maybe uh, interview some of the customers who have bought the t-shirts, or especially the t-shirts and said, what was it like for you to wear that t-shirt? Where did you wear it to? Were you wearing it to a family gathering? <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner? (laughs) Were you wearing it to, you know, to a a party? Did you wear it to work? Like, where did you wear it? What kind of reactions did you get? How did you feel when you got that? So kind of like doing that little, that interview, I think that would be uh, a lot of fun. And then as a, as a customer and potential customers out there, they can see that and like, oh yeah, I should wear that to my next, the next party or social gathering that I go to and see what kind of reactions I get. Yeah, she actually, she has two little boys and they're very much a feminist family. I think that would be really interesting is, you know, where her little boys are wearing those and where her husband is. And, you know, they march together with those t-shirts on and, you know, they wear them to school. I think that's a really interesting context too. Yeah, she has her boys wear like girls to the front, basically. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, and then also with her stuff too, does it if you if she wants to make people feel uncomfortable, does it make people feel uncomfortable? You know, maybe you're trying to shake things up, maybe you're trying to shake up that bottle, or or is it something that's a conversation starter? And yeah. And then community, mm-hmm. there's such a strong community here for her, right? Yes, for sure, for sure. And she and she could really could tap into it, maybe even more than she's doing right now. And to, again, to get people to share it, maybe even crowdsource some ideas for new slogans for the t-shirt so they could do a, she could do a contest where people could publish their slogans on Instagram, you know, tag Skylar U, and then people vote, you know, vote on based on likes or something. And then the top one gets to be made into a t-shirt. Perfect. Yeah. Love that. Three C's hard at work there. (laughs) (laughs) So if we take this and sort of shift the model, right? So these are the three C's and you're kind of, you're getting down to the core of your business, another C, but um, you're getting down to the core of, of your brand message, which is what you teach people how to do. Then how do they take this and translate it to perhaps to pitching to people? So pitching to distributors. So that would be like, we have a client, um, Dry Home, another shout out who got in front of a really, really big business to try and pitch her product to, or like if you're trying to get investors, because a lot of our clients are also trying to build with investors. So would you say the same sort of model, how would you tailor this to pitch to people outside of your direct to customer type model? Yeah. So here's what's interesting. So let me start with investors and then we'll go to the distributors. So, because they're a little bit different in their approaches. So I've done a number of workshops and I've helped startups and incubators here in Orlando, Florida, where I live with pitching to investors. Here's what's interesting about investors is that they actually care less about the product itself because products to them are interchangeable. We can, we can tweak the product, we can change it, we can make it different. What investors care most about is the team. So the founder and the people they have on their team because investors know that the team is who's, is who's going to execute on it, on whatever the idea is. That's the number one. Number two is the market. So what is the market opportunity and how can this product tap into that market? So that's what they care most about. So as a product-based entrepreneur, make sure that you have a really strong team. Now, they don't have to necessarily have to be employees, but they could be people that you're working with. It could be your other contractors, your vendors. So how are you actually executing to market? And what is the market potential for the product that you're doing? And obviously, they want to see if you have been selling the product, what have been the results so far, what, you know, your margins and your financials will be important, but really it's the team and the market opportunity. That's really good advice. So the team would be sort of talking about who you are and how you would sort of run the business. And then for example, let's say you're manufacturing them all locally or domestically, what that team looks like, who's making the product, what they can turn out, um, what they've maybe done before. So, because it's true, people, I even say it with when we're going to get to distributors or let's say buyers. Um, I always tell my clients, I want them to look like they're backed or they have like a million dollars behind them, even if they're bootstrapping this business, because people are more likely to buy into something that looks like they can, you can do it. You can hold your own. Like you're going to ship on time. The product's going to be of good quality. So it's, it's letting people know, like you've got all the right people set up. You just need the funds to kind of push it 
forward. Yeah. You even see it on Shark Tank, right? Where they're like, I love you. Yes, I will invest in your product. Uh, I really don't like you. <laughs> <I'm> gonna, <laughs> right. <I'm out. laughs> yeah, right. Because the sharks know like we can change your product. But if, right. you, if you've shown that you have a proven track record of reliability, that you can execute on a plan, that you're also agile, that you're willing, that you're coachable is what we would say. So you're willing to take direction and change your approach if needed. And if the market shifts, that you're, you're not so stubborn that you almost, all you see is your own product and you're unwilling to change anything about it. Mm-hmm. You don't like, you don't like that. So true. <laughs> and if, and let's just say, well, a hundred percent, because if you're not a team player or you're not willing to hear what needs to happen, you're so set on, on whatever you're doing, the business is going to eventually bomb, whether or not you have the money, like you'll burn through it. So, and then also I would tell everybody, and we talk about these strength finders and Colby, I mean, it's in our community, but if you don't have the right tools or you're not the person that should be running the business, then maybe you look for a teammate or somebody that can kind of help balance you out before you ever go to an investor so that your team feels full and ready to go. Yes. That's a great point. There's a book called Traction. I don't know if you all have heard of it. There's so there's a book called Traction, which is kind of like the nuts and bolts of this business approach. And then they have a story-based version of it called Get a Grip. Highly recommend it. So, but they talk about how there's two key people in a business. You're the visionary the idea person, you know, the relationship person, all of that, then there's the integrator. And the integrator is kind of the, the one who, uh, you know, like is the operations, logistics, keeps the deadlines, you know, it keeps everything moving along because you can't really expect the visionary to do that. And you can't really expect the integrator to have what the visionary has. So you really need to have both of those people mm-hmm. in your company. So then let's move this over to then pitching to like a distributor or buyer for the product. How would that be different? So for buyers, what they want to know is that is reliability. I can imagine like they want to know, okay, if we're requesting a thousand of your products, you know, whatever the numbers happen to be, are you going to be able to deliver those when we need them? Because we're going to have shelf space waiting for you. And if those products don't come in, what are we supposed to do about it? So I can imagine they want to make sure reliability. And then is there, have you shown that there is a market demand for your product? Because what, what buyer, what distributor wants the an inventory that they can't turn over. So maybe even, and I'm not a product-based entrepreneur. I, I know enough probably to be dangerous, but like what's your inventory shelf life? Like your, what is it called? Like your inventory refresh rate or something like how long turn does it turn over? Right. Turn over. Yeah. So I can imagine that's probably what they would want to know. Is it a month or six months, whatever that number is? Is it is that number good for the type of product that you have? Mm-hmm. So if right. I can reorder. <laughs> Right, I said right on the money because we coach people to take their most popular product and pitch that because you know the sales behind it. You know there's demand there. You know that people love it and that you can you want to build that relationship. You don't want to like offload your you know bad inventory onto like boutiques. You want to give them your best selling item so they can sell more of it. And that's the whole idea. Oh, that's such a great point, right? Because and then maybe it's also and, and again you guys would know this better than me is try to get, build that demand online first and make sure that you are ready to go to a buyer or distributor when you're in the strongest position that you can be. So in other words, maybe don't go too early. Yeah. Um, True. And I think the other thing that people do is, is I, well, I think if you got consistent with this, the consistency, the context, and you talked about it and there what, and it didn't resonate with people, then you could almost also change that a bit because sometimes people are trying to sell something that nobody wants, but they might have something over here that they're, they're pushing against. They don't really want to, to sell that product. They think their main product is this, but they're not realizing that there's something else that people are actually telling you that they, they want. Um, yeah. Or maybe just are, the name of the product. Maybe yeah. you, maybe the name that you think of you love, but maybe just customers are just like, oh, I don't get it. All right. I don't like it. And so yeah, testing that first before you're going out to investors or buyers to, to pitch it to would be a good idea. hundred mm-hmm. percent. And, and knowing that, so we ask people their numbers all the time or we ask them, well, how long will this take? Or what are your minimum orders? And they don't normally know. And if they can't tell us their coaches and consultants, then there's, they shouldn't be getting in front of buyers just yet. So um, really good points. Thank you. Do you remember back in the day when, um, was it Chrysler or Ford or something that came out with a Nova, which was in Mexico, mean no go for a car. (laughs) It's just like, it's funny because even huge companies like that run into things where it's not right on, right? They, they, there's a misstep somehow. So it's everybody, even the big companies, even the small companies that there might not be the, it might get lost in translation literally or figuratively. 
Yeah, I was just reading an article today and they were talking about missteps that big companies have had. And like Google Glass, when they released that, you know, people, they sold it for $1,500, the, the glasses that had the augmented reality, whatever they had on it. But the product was, was not ready for market. It was not good. So Google ended up pulling it. Verizon recently spent a billion dollars, yes, a billion with a B, on some online video platform to compete with YouTube that they thought Verizon customers would want. Have you ever heard of it? Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> because after three years, no one used it in a billion dollars. And you know what the commonality was with all these examples in this article? No market research. They never got a really good sense of what consumer behavior actually was, what consumers wanted. And as entrepreneurs, we get so scared to talk to real people, to talk to real customers. We don't want them to shoot down our idea. They don't, we don't want them to say, oh, I don't like your product. But if you don't find that out as soon as possible and as early as possible, then you, you're you potentially wasting a lot of time and money putting something out there that people don't want. But you can find what they do want as long as you start talking to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, you know, we ask them to do surveys. A lot of times we're like for me, at least with Designer Consulting Co-op, I'm working with startups. So they're even coming up with the name of their brand. Like it's so, so beginner. And, and sometimes it's like, well, does that name resonate with the kind of people you're selling it to? So I have a client doing stuff for like mm, seven to 10 year old girls. And she found this logo that she loves. She showed it to her daughters that are that age and they do not love it, you know? And so it's like, but if you're selling to them then you need to be focused on sort of what they like, which is all, I mean, you know, bright, like neon colors, sparkles, like sparkles <laughs> unicorns, <Yeah. laughs> but that's just what they're into. They're not into like the really cute, like cursive writing that we think would be cute, you know? So it's really, it's getting that feedback. But I also tell my clients sometimes get the feedback, but take it as constructive criticism. Cause if you're ever going to work, I the biggest killer of all dreams or when you're trying to work with um, showrooms, for example, showrooms will always tell you like a showroom is a rep that will represent you to a wholesale buyer, for example. And when you're trying to get a showroom, you're kind of being interviewed by them and they'll all give you their opinion. And oftentimes their opinion is to make it easier for them to sell it. It's shortcuts for them because it's just going to make it easier. And it doesn't always work some of the feedback's great. Like if they're like, oh, this price point's crazy. We're never going to get so-and-so to buy it at that. Okay, great. But take everything that they say with a grain of salt, because if you've done this research, right, on your customer and what their needs are, then you know more than they do at some point, like in the very, very beginning, let's say. Yes. Well, and also look for the repeated message. So if one person says it, you're like, oh, okay, maybe. But then you have five people who say the same thing. Then you can say, okay, I need to look at this then. 100%. 100%. Maybe they, and they should write that down. I mean, we do the same thing with clients that we coach. You know, if they bring up the same question, then there's a bigger problem to be solved there. So I think it's the exact same thing with if people aren't understanding your core message, if they always ask you the same question, well, what does this do? Then you need to get better at explaining what it does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And even looking at the community part, I think it's difficult to look at something and be like, oh, I don't have this big movement behind me, you know, feminism or, or breastfeeding or whatever. But it doesn't have to be something fancy. Um, did you know? that Fruit Loops are all the same flavor. They just change up the coloring. So in my mind, that's just like, you know, people love Fruit Loops though. You, you just keep it really simple. Those my are just variations. Uh, I know, I know. When I read that, I was like, what? I feel so betrayed. Um, so it's just, yeah, they don't obviously disclose that, but it doesn't have to be something really fancy, right? It's just somebody, they love the taste. The transformation is the yumminess or whatever. Just, there's no um, movement behind cereal, but people are willing to pay for it and they like, that visually, that visual connection, the bright colors, the fun, eat this for breakfast. It's so much fun, blah, blah, blah. You know, instead of like something that was all the same color. Right. So even looking at that, like you can connect with people in a community sense type of way. It doesn't have to be something as grand as feminism, you know? I'm glad you brought that up because even like, for example, Tropical Shores Popcorn, which is a client of ours as well, she's a local business. She's a brick and mortar that does popcorn. She has 40 flavors and she's in a resort town in Florida plus another spot. And so it's like, well, it could just be people who like popcorn or that like the idea of sampling 40 flavors of popcorn um, or that are tourists and they're willing to purchase things that maybe feel more local when it's called tropical you're like, yeah, I'm going in if I'm in Florida and I'm not usually from tropical places. So your community doesn't have to be big, but I think it goes back to that ideal customer avatar, like who your customer is that you're selling to. And there's a group of people there. So if they, if you got them all in your house and like your living room and you were talking to them about it, how do you speak to the people in your living room? How are you like, this is perfect for you because... 
everything Carol and, Cox said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, right. Exactly. Well, even she could tie in, you know, like support local, shop local, support lo- local businesses. And then obviously being in Florida, the tropical aspect of it and the, the variety of flavors. So there's things that she can, she can pull from for like a, kind of a broader message mm-hmm. than, than just, you know, taste this delicious popcorn. <laughs> like gifts, like gifts, like gifts from Florida, you know, like a big thing. I remember back in the eighties when I was young, my mom would always send boxes, like order boxes of oranges and have them shipped to our relatives who lived up North. Cause you know, being in Florida, we would, we'd have oranges and then they wouldn't. Now, nowadays you can get any fruit and vegetable you want mm-hmm. on the country year round. But back then it was a big deal and it was a kind of a nice Christmas gift. So that could be the same thing. I love that. So Carol, if you listen to the podcast, you've probably heard us ask these questions at the end. Um, Just some fun questions to kind of get to know you a bit more. So um, it's just rapid fire answer at your will. So what is your coffee order? So I like as well, just regular coffee, but with uh, like a soy milk or not, sometimes a non-dairy milk, no sugar. Have you tried oat milk yet? No, I, I drink a lot of flax milk. Okay. Oatly, if you go to, because you're a fellow vegan, <laughs> right? Yes. Oatly is really good. So oh, Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> so what's the favorite thing on your desk? Favorite thing on my desk? Oh, that would probably be my mug of tea. So I'm actually drinking more tea than I drink coffee. So okay. I drink like different types of tea all day long. Like I'm eyeing one I have over there. So that would be my tea mug. Okay. And then finish the sentence. When I pick up my phone, I... Go to Twitter. <laughs> Are you going to Twitter? Really? Yes. It's because of it's the it's the politics. news. Well, it's the politics part. So I am a political analyst on TV during election seasons, and so I love Twitter because like the journalists and reporters and like Twitter political people I follow are so funny and pithy in their tweets that it just it, you know it kind of it makes me mad and laugh at the same time. Oh yeah, they're getting good. Like I think the Democratic. The Democratic Party just trolled the White House. So that's a whole other thing when this was being recorded. Uh, let Twitter. me give you a shortcut for that, um, Carol. So if you do you have Alexa. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, like, we can't say it too loud. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so from here forward, I will call her Amanda. Okay. So if you say Amanda, list off, if you hook, you have to hook up your Twitter feed. If you say what's happening on Twitter, then she'll let you know all the tweets of people you follow, what's trending, all that stuff. And so you can do that where you're getting ready. And that will be- Oh, even be better. Then I, wow, I can multitask on yep, Twitter. Yep. Yeah. Thank Podcast so Twitter. <laughs> yes, <welcome>. awesome. <laughs> okay, you wish you knew how to? Sing. Hmm, that's I'm, cool. to- I'm tone deaf, cannot sing, but I wish I could. That's awesome. What was the last show you binge watched? The Crown. Good show. I know. I can't wait for season three. I know. Let's see the new cast too. Um, so what, I don't know if you have a business card yet. I, we're going to have to change this question because people are like, who has a business card? But if you do, <laughs> still have one. Um, what should the title on your business card actually say? All the things. Like trying to do too many things at one time. <laughs> totally. And then do you have, I mean, you go on stage a lot. So you speak, like you said, TED, you teach people how to do TEDx talks. You're on the news. Um, do you have an alter ego or stage persona to do that? Yeah. So I call her Carrie Okay. instead of Carol. And so I never had a nickname growing up. And then about five years ago, my, my mom was like, oh, I should have given you a nickname and called you Carrie. I'm like, oh, okay. So now I use Carrie. Awesome. And then how do our, how do our listeners find you? So the best place is to go to speakingyourbrand.com slash product boss. So that's all one word. And I actually have a free PDF download that you can get there that has a lot of the things that we talked about today. So some of the story structure framework. So in case you were driving and couldn't take notes, you can go get that there. So it's speakingyourbrand.com slash product boss. And then of course, if you're, you're already listening to the podcast, so jump on over to the Speaking Your Brand podcast and find an episode that looks great and start listening. Thank you so much, Carol. It was such a pleasure to have you today. Likewise. Thank you for having me. This episode is over, but it doesn't have to end. Head over to our Facebook group, search for the Product Boss Biz Community, or the link is also in the show notes. Come connect with other product bosses just like you. We'll see you in there. If you love the Product Boss Podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, share, rate, and give a review on iTunes. Until next time, product bosses, let's make it happen.